Part 8, we faced an existential crisis with regard to the Quentin quest. None of it seemed to make any sense. Quentin was tasked with getting Danny to honor a marriage pact that didn't even involve her. And the pact didn't even benefit Viserys. And the pact was impossible to begin with because Willem Derry wasn't a lord. And despite the Martells having numerous resources abroad, Quentin was afforded none of them. Without a doubt, the Quentin quest was ill-conceived and ill-resourced. In fact, Ariana Martell even comments about this, mocking her father for only sending five knights and a maester with Quentin. In fact, Doran only sent four knights and a maester with Quentin. This is likely a typo. Now, the primary argument for Doran's inaction is that he was being cautious. He wanted the whole thing to be kept a secret. Yet if Doran was being cautious, why put the fate of Dorne and his house in the hands of an enemy? Why would a cautious man leave the success of the quest to House Ironwood? So in part one, we talked about the houses that are friendly to Doran Martell, the ones Oberyn brought to King's Landing, the ones Doran has at the Water Gardens with him, the ones that Doran invites to dinner. House Ironwood is not among them. In fact, it should be noted that in nearly every respect, the Ironwoods and the Martells should have a hostile relationship. One in which there is no way in hell a cautious man like Doran Martell should ever trust them. First of all, the Ironwoods are the second most powerful house in Dorne, meaning in the world of Ice and Fire, they are likely looking to usurp the Martell's power. Jamie Lannister talks about this relationship in A Storm of Swords. Every great lord has unruly bannermen who envy him his place. My father had the Reigns and Tarbex. The Tyrells have the Florence. Hoster Tully had Walder Frey. Only strength keeps such men in their place. The moment they smell weakness, during the Age of Heroes, the Boltons used to flay the Starks and wear their skins as cloaks. So Jaime warns of the unruly bannermen who rise up during times of weakness. Of course, Doran Martell is famously perceived as weak, and there is no Dornish bannermen more unruly than the Ironwoods. In fact, there's bad blood between the Martells and the Ironwoods going back a thousand years. The Ironwoods were the most powerful house in Dorne, but were brought down by Queen Nymeria and her new allies, the Martells. The Ironwoods rose up several times against the Martells over the centuries, and then consistently sided with the Blackfires against the Martells and the Targaryens in three Blackfire rebellions. The Ironwoods are described by Maesters as the Dornish house most likely to rebel. Now it's quite significant that the Ironwoods were Blackfire supporters, and the Blackfire rebellion was caused by the fear of Dornish influence at court. What did the Ironwoods, a Dornish house themselves, Fear about Dornish influence. Well, it should be noted that the Ironwoods are stony Dornish, with blonde hair and blue eyes, meaning they mainly descend from those of Andal and First Men descent, rather than the Roynish that came with Queen Nymeria. The Ironwoods likely value the customs of their ancestors, namely patrilineal succession, rather than gender-neutral succession under Dornish law. And sure enough, we find this to be the case. Ariana comments that Anders Ironwood is Kristen Cole reborn, wanting the return of patrilineal succession to Dorne. Kristen Cole was Lord Commander of the Kingsguard during the Dance of the Dragons, who sided with the patrilineal Green faction. And so we really find ourselves back with the metaphor at the Water Garden that we talked about in Part 1. The nut-brown girl topples the tow-headed boy. The Ironwoods are the very embodiment of that blonde boy who has been toppled by the Martells, the nut-brown girl. But this is all history. Let's talk about some more recent events. We know that when Oberyn was around 16 years old, he banged Ormond Ironwood's paramour, and then, either intentionally or accidentally, killed Ormond in a duel. As restitution, Oberyn was exiled, and later on, after Oberyn's return, Quentin Martell was taken on as a ward by the Ironwoods. Incidentally, the warding of Quentin seems to be a contributing factor to Doran Martell's marriage falling apart. Now, Quentin has grown up to like the Ironwoods, and even sees Anders Ironwood as a father. He even chose to be knighted by Anders Ironwood rather than Oberyn Martell. So we can imagine the state of these families emotionally. Anders Ironwood's grandfather was killed by Doran Martell's brother, and now Doran Martell's son was taken by Anders Ironwood, and that son sees Anders Ironwood as a father. How can there not be at least some resentment between these two families? But even more important than these emotions is the actual political situation. Prior to the Quentin quest, Quentin was being raised at Ironwood and was being befriended by members of House Ironwood. Most importantly, Anders' daughter Gwyneth Ironwood had shown romantic interest in Quentin. Had the Quentin quest not happened, Quentin Martell probably would have married Gwyneth Ironwood. That was certainly both Quentin and Gwyneth's desire. 
So with a Gwyneth Quentin marriage, House Ironwood stood to gain considerable influence over House Martell through Quentin. And let's remember that under patrilineal succession, which Anders Ironwood wanted, pro-Ironwood Quentin would be Lord of Sunspear with Gwyneth Ironwood as his lady. So now let's get back to Doran Martell's thought process about the Quentin quest. Why would Doran Martell place the success of the Quentin quest in the hands of a stony Dornish non-Roinar family who did not value Dornish law or the Roinish way of life? Why would he trust a family that had taken up arms against his house repeatedly and a family that exiled his brother and who stole away his son? But most importantly, why would Doran Martell, a cautious man, trust a family whose best interest is for Quentin to fail? After all, if Quentin marries Danny, he can't exactly marry Gwyneth, can he? In fact, let's take a moment to look at Quentin's Ironwood entourage. We have Cletus Ironwood, Anders Ironwood's son, and we have Archibald Ironwood, Anders' nephew. These two would naturally be loyal to House Ironwood. Then we have Garrus Drinkwater. The Drinkwaters are landed knights and apparently bannermen to House Ironwood. In fact, both Drink and his sisters either live at Ironwood or close by. Next, there's Willem Wells. We don't know much about House Wells, other than that the warrior's sons are led by Theoden Wells. Doran does say that Willem is a knight in service of Anders Ironwood. He also says the same of Drink and Arch. So we find that the four knights that accompany Quentin seem to all be loyal to Anders Ironwood. Two of them are even Ironwoods themselves. Finally, there's Maester Kedri. We don't know who exactly Kedri is. He's not the maester for the Water Gardens or Sunspear. That's Maester Calliot and Maester Miles, respectively. He might be the Ironwood maester, but we simply don't know. We do know that Doran speaks Kedri's name to both Ariana and Quentin, so they seem to be familiar with who he is, for what that's worth. His exact identity, though, is not really important. Maesters are supposed to be loyal to where they serve. Since Kedri is not the Sunspear Maester, we know he isn't loyal to Doran. Additionally, according to Archmaester Marwyn, the Maesters as a whole are anti-dragon and are responsible for killing them off. And according to Lady Dustin, the Maesters orchestrated Rickard Stark's Southern ambitions, which means they are also likely anti-Targaryen. I did a whole series on the Maesters called Dragonless Ambitions if you'd like to check that out. The point is, a conspiracy to bring back dragons or Targaryens really has no reason to trust a Maester. And Doran would likely know about the Citadel's Dragonless Ambitions, as Sorella Sand, Kyburn, and likely Oberyn all knew the very verbose Marwyn. And we do find that Doran himself does not trust maesters. Maester Calliot finds the need to read Doran's mail, which means Doran isn't sharing this information with him forthright. Additionally, Doran sends Calliot away when discussing plans with Ario Hota in A Feast for Crows, and waits for Calliot to leave the room before discussing plans with the Sand Snakes in A Dance with Dragons. And Doran finds the need to employ a non-maester raven tender at the Water Gardens, despite having Calliot. He even sends this raven tender with Ariana on her trip to find Aegon. So Quentin had with him four Ironwood knights and a maester. Doran does not have a single loyal man on the Quentin quest. Let's compare this with Ariana's mission to Aegon. We have Daemon Sand, Oberyn's squire, Joss Hood and Garibald Shells, knights in service to Sunspear. We have Oberyn's daughter Elia Sand and Jane Ladybright, who I imagine is Sunspear's treasurer's daughter. And as we said before, for the Ravens, we have Feathers, who has been managing Ravens at the Water Garden for years, and who is notably not a maester. So while Quentin's companions do not have a single person loyal to Sunspear, the entirety of Ariana's companions are loyal to Sunspear. So Quentin's party shows that the Quentin quest wasn't just under-resourced, but it was essentially staffed with participants who had wanted to fail, and participants who Doran knows would want it to fail. We really must come to the conclusion that Doran Martell had no expectation that the Quentin quest would ever succeed. Now you may be thinking, would Doran Martell really send his son on a quest that he didn't think he would succeed on? Isn't that dangerous? Well, not necessarily. Doran may have expected that the crew would never find passage to Slaver's Bay. And although House Ironwood would want Quentin to fail, they would want him to fail safely. After all, for House Ironwood to gain, Quentin would need to return home to marry Gwyneth. And failing safely does seem to be the goal of Quentin's companions, or at least the goal of Garrus Drinkwater. It's rather clear that Drink, every step of the journey, wanted Quentin to fail and return home. 
We first meet Drink in the Merchant's Man chapter, when he and Quentin are trying to find passage to Slaver's Bay. They've been trying and failing for 20 days, but amazingly, they actually stumble upon a man who is willing to take them to Marine, the captain of Adventure. Their apparent success is short-lived, though, as right after arranging passage, Drink suddenly thinks the adventure is too dangerous because the captain is not to be trusted. Drink's reasoning for not trusting the captain is fairly flimsy. The captain accepted their offer of triple payment too quickly. Now, it should be noted that Quentin describes Garrus as a man who is confident, bold, and not one to think about danger. So it's a bit out of character for him to suddenly fear the captain of the adventure. And Drink later completely forgets about the supposed danger of the adventure when he brings up the ship later. His problem now with the adventure is the smell. Now, after nixing the adventure, Drink makes a number of bad suggestions on getting to Marine. Sail to New Gis, which would likely strand them. Seek out a Westerasi, of which there are none. Seek out a Bravosi, who will refuse to go to Slaver's Bay. Buy a ship, of which Arch, Drink, and Quentin cannot sail. And take the Demon Road, which is too slow. After listing many bad options, Drink suggests going home. Twice. Now again, this is out of character for Drink. Quentin specifically says that Drink doesn't think about failure, and yet here he is, suggesting quitting. Of course, Quentin is not a quitter and wants to take the adventure, and so Drink then suggests that they join the Windblown. Now we have to keep in mind that had Quentin taken adventure, he would have certainly arrived in Marine before Danny's engagement to Hisdar. We know this because Danny speaks of the death of King Cleon II, along with the news of Yunkai's cell swords at Astapor on the day she becomes engaged. Quentin arrives in Slaver's Bay among these cell swords around the time of King Cleon II's death. Not to mention, Adventure was a swift ship and would have left immediately, well ahead of the Windblown, who had to fill out their ranks. The point being, had Quentin taken Adventure, he wouldn't have come too late. There was a chance Quentin could have actually succeeded in his quest against all expectations. Drink, though, prevented this. In fact, later on, Drink delays the mission further. In the Windblown chapter, we find Drink, Arch, and Quentin three days from Yunkai, slowly, slowly marching north. Quentin is eager to desert at this point, but it's Drink that convinces Quentin to wait a few more days. After two days, the crew is sent deep into the Yellow Hills to defect. They are captured by the Stormcrows and spend another day in a cell before meeting Danny. Drink's decision slowed them about another week, making Quentin's arrival on the inconvenient day before Danny's marriage. Now you may think that a week doesn't make much of a difference at this point, but keep in mind that Yunkai threatens war if Danny does not wed his dar just two days before her marriage. Drink's delay turns Quentin's long-shot proposal into an impossibility. But it doesn't even end there. After Danny's departure, Drink again repeatedly urges Quentin to go home. In the Spurn Suitor chapter, Drink tells him that Barristan Selmy's wisdom should be heeded, that the city isn't safe, that Danny will still be married if she returns, that dragons are dangerous, and that the windblown can't be trusted. And then in the Dragon Tamer chapter, Drink tries to dissuade Quentin from stealing a dragon by reminding him of the falling dangers of dragons and the burning dangers of dragons. And then again in the Pyramid, he tells Quentin that his plan won't work and that dragons are too wild. So despite Drink being a man who Quentin describes as confident, fearless, and tenacious, Drink spends the entire Quentin quest reminding Quentin how dangerous things are around him and trying to get Quentin to go home. He even tells him, men die on grand adventures. And when not trying to get Quentin to quit, he slows the mission, delaying Quentin's arrival to Marine by over three months. Essentially, Garrus Drinkwater acts just as one would expect an Ironwood crony to act. He wants the Quentin quest to fail and for Quentin to return home safely. But the big question to all of this is why? Why would Doran Martell bother sending his son on an adventure just to fail? What's the point? Well, misdirection for House Ironwood and other enemy spies would be the obvious answer. Feign to the right, go left. But I do think it all goes a bit deeper. That Doran's plans are part of a larger battle. We should once again remind ourselves that the Ironwoods were Blackfire supporters. And Aegon, whether a Blackfire or not, certainly has Blackfire support, namely the Golden Company. Delaying Quentin to Slaver's Bay not only facilitates a quentin Gwyneth marriage, but it also facilitates an aegon Danny marriage. And I do wonder if the Quentin quest didn't travel along a trail of Aegon supporters. Let's remember that it's Cletus Ironwood that chooses the passage to Volantis, the Meadowlark. And it's the captain of the Meadowlark that recommends where they stay in Volantis, 
the Merchant's House. And the Merchant's House is the base of operation for the widow of the waterfront, a rich slaver who used to be married to a prominent nobleman of the Elephant Faction. Of course, the Elephant Faction is assisting the Aegon cause, and the widow does say that captains indebted to her are assisting Aegon as well. Of course, the Merchant's House is the biggest inn in the city, so perhaps there's nothing to Quentin's group staying there. But it's rather curious that the innkeep of the Merchant's House never introduces Quentin and his companions to the widow of the waterfront, who has the means to get them to Slaver's Bay. It's also interesting that it's at the Merchant's House where they find the Windblown recruiting. Now I will say that the Windblown have a very interesting relationship with Garrus Drinkwater. There are two unlikely events that show that there must be some collusion going on. The first happens when Quentin's crew is south of Yunkai. Quentin wants to defect, but Drink asks Quentin to wait a few days. Then, two days later, the Tattered Prince asks the Westerasi to defect. It is simply miraculous that the Tattered Prince requested Quentin's entourage to do exactly what they were planning on doing. And the fact that Drink knew the timing of this event is beyond suspicious. The second unlikely event happens when Quentin has Drink reach out to the Windblown to have them help him steal a dragon. Drink happens to find the Windblown in Marine with amazing ease. First of all, it's a bit odd that the Windblown are still in the city, considering that they're employed by the Yunkai. But even if Beans, Books, and Old Bill Bones were in the city, it's rather remarkable that Drink was able to find them out of all of Marine's establishments. And it's rather interesting that when Quentin, Arch, and Drink go to meet the Tattered Prince, they do it at an establishment called the Purple Lotus. Tatters seems rather familiar with the establishment and its owner, Zahrina. Zahrina wears a dark red tokar fringed with tiny golden skulls. And we know who else wears golden skulls, members of the Golden Company. It is their sigil. So the Quentin quest seems to be a misdirection, and its audience seems to be the Aegon cause. Doran may be trying to convince the Aegon cause that he's a loyal Targaryen supporter. And this, of course, will greatly affect Ariana's meeting with Aegon. But if the Quentin quest is simply a misdirection, What's Doran's real plan with dragons? Well, we'll talk about that and Maester Marwyn in part 10.